By popular request, this video is all about pearls. We'll begin with the formation, an overview of saltwater and freshwater pearls, and the brief history. Let's begin by looking at the formation of a pearl. In this diagram, we have four layers. In yellow, A, the outer layer of the shell. In gray, B, the nacreous layer. In C, the orange cellular layer, which is the epithelial layer of the mantle. And D, pink, the mantle itself. A pearl is formed when a piece of detritus, like sand, lands inside a mollusk's shell. In order to protect itself, the mollusk begins to secrete nacre. And as layers deposit around this piece of detritus, like sand, the pearl is formed. Next, we'll compare saltwater versus freshwater pearls. The mollusks differ between the two. Saltwater uh, pearls are formed in oysters, and they range from 2 to 12 millimeters. Rarely will you find one larger in size than that, whereas a freshwater pearl is generally formed in a mussel, and they can reach sizes greater than 16 millimeters. The colors differ a little bit. For saltwater, you've got the golden South Seas, white, and of course, the beautiful Tahitian pearls. Freshwater is generally more of a white family of pearls, and then you also do get lavenders, peaches, and some light purples as well. The growth period for saltwater pearls is typically longer, and that is how they become larger in size. Nacre growth is a little bit faster for freshwater per year, and the quality, it's a little bit more lustrous for saltwater, but freshwater is thicker, whereas the freshwater pearl is almost generally uh, completely nacre around whatever the initial irritant or nucleus is. In terms of price, saltwater tends to be a bit more expensive because of the time it takes to produce them and their larger size and better luster, but freshwater is readily available and it can have a luster that rivals that of saltwater as well, so you can get some really good value in freshwater pearls. Let's take a look at some pearls. Freshwater pearls can come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. There are fancy types, as we are looking at here. There are, of course, the round types as well that do come in different varieties, like those that are encircled, round, oblong, or teardrop. Here's a great example of some nacre-formed uh, pearls that are just quite loose and free. Tahitian pearls are generally more round or spherical, with the exception of the keshi. And of course, we should look at pearl sizes. So as with a diamond, as things go up, they seem to grow exponentially. A five millimeter pearl will look significantly smaller than let's say a nine millimeter pearl. In the first century, Julius Caesar declared that pearls were meant for the ruling class, but by the fifth century, they were being woven into garments and very popular with women. Caligula infamously provided his horse with a pearl necklace. He was very good to his horse, often giving it drinks of liquor um, and feeding it oats that have been cut with ground up flakes of gold. No wonder that he was murdered by 30 stab wounds after only four years of ruling. Pliny the Elder recorded that Cleopatra once bet Mark Anthony that she could provide the most lavish dinner ever recorded. In order to make good on this promise, she took one of her pearl earrings, dropped it into a goblet of wine, and drank it. The value of this was tens of millions of denarii. I think that this could be a fun one to test out ourselves, so I'm going to take one pearl earring and drop it into some vinegar. Let's see how the pearl fares.
hours in vinegar resulted in about three millimeters of nacre loss. I think it's safe to say that this story has been embellished for dramatic effect. Until the 20th century, pearls were a naturally occurring phenomena reserved for the elite and royalty. Most of the largest examples found their way into the jewel box of the royals. Prince Charles I had a single large pearl earring, Sir Walter Raleigh had a double pearl earring, and Marie Antoinette's La Peregrina is well known and recently sold at auction. The race to conquer the New World yielded a surprising benefit. The explorers found that the indigenous wore strands of pearls. The riverbeds of the Mississippi and the coast were rich with oysters and mussels, and from the 16th century onward, these were exported back to Europe in such high numbers that the New World became synonymous with the land of the pearl. As pearls became more readily available, they became more and more popular in jewelry. Pearls, being white, were symbols of purity and innocence. They were used in mourning pieces and also in sentimental pieces. Let's take a look at some jewelry. First, we have a mourning locket, complete with the typical neoclassical urn motif, with hair elements and pearls. In this case, the pearls may symbolize tears. Next, we have a flat cut garnet and pearl brooch. Much like a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not always a square. A piece of jewelry with hair is always a sentimental piece, but not always a mourning piece. In the absence of typical mourning symbolism, I would call this a sentimental piece. It may have been an amatory piece given to a betrothed. This is a pendant from my personal collection. In the 18th and 19th century, it was popular to present young women with a perure of seed pearls strung with white horse hair on mother of pearl. These were normally gifted for important events, such as weddings. The tiny pearls generally came from the coast of Ceylon and the white horse hair was hand-selected to make sure that it was going to be durable enough to last. Imagine that these were produced with limited light sources. It's quite amazing. In 1861, Mary Todd Lincoln had cause to celebrate. She was accompanying her husband, Abraham Lincoln, to his inauguration, and to dress for the occasion, she wore a demi perure from Tiffany. A typical perure costing $1,000 included a collar necklace, a pair of bracelets, earrings, and one or possibly two brooches, and a corsage brooch. President Lincoln went the slightly more cost-effective method and chose the Demerit Perure, which included a necklace, a pair of bracelets, and that cost the princely sum of $530. For context, that is worth roughly $40,000 in today's money. Pearls were also popular in Art Nouveau jewelry and this brooch is marked Faberath & Company, founded in Newark, New Jersey in 1908 by John Henry Faberath, a jeweler and inventor that held patents for pearl setting and jewelry findings. A very small firm, they employed just five workers and they worked primarily in 14 karat gold. The firm was last listed in their Newark directory in 1926. In the early 1900s, a simple pearl necklace of 16 to 18 inches with symmetrical 7.5 millimeter pearls could cost upward of $500. They were seen as the ultimate status symbol. It was very difficult to find well-matched pearls because they were all natural. In 1916, Mayplant was seated next to Cartier at a dinner. She was the wife of the railroad tycoon Morton Plant, and she and Cartier were discussing how wonderful pearls are when he said that she should buy the two strands that he just created at over a million dollars, she laughed and said that she couldn't afford it. The two devised a plan, and she ended up exchanging a Fifth Avenue mansion and $100 in exchange for these strands of pearls. This property still belongs to Cartier and is a flagship for them in New York City. In my next video, we'll cover the fascinating history of faux pearls, the story of cultured pearls, We'll look at pearl grading and why it's an art and not so much a science, how to select pearls and how to care for pearls. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel.